to the Blue Collar and Life and Show. It's your host, Jonah. Hey guys, it's your co-host, T. Today's guest is Pepper Ann, an inspiring true crime investigative author. And today we are going to be investigating why she got into writing books on true crime. Not only that, she has bombshell evidence of all type that we will share with you along the way as she has given us behind the scenes looks on how she plans to get her book out to the public. She will drop hints to a curveball no one may see coming. How are you, Pepper? I'm well, and thank you both for having me on the show. Of course, and I'm glad that we were able to get in touch and we can do this. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm related to one of the biggest cattle rustlers of our time, and he's serving 14 life sentences in the Texas State Penitentiary. Once I started reading his charges and uncovering the way that his cases were handled, I decided to dig a little deeper and write about it. I had no idea, though, what I was uncovering would change mine, his, and the rest of our family's lives. Really? I had thought that I was only going to, yeah, I thought that I was only going to be writing about cattle wrestling, but it turns out I'm writing about a lot more. So what kind of things are you writing about? I've uncovered a lot of criminals who were involved in crimes with him who are still committing crimes today and they're more on a felony level instead of a misdemeanor i got you and you probably want to save that for later don't you i do what do you enjoy most about the writing style that you do well i was fortunate enough to find an editor who helped me bring out my artistic side of writing he is a dear friend who's been with me from the beginning Once I realized that it was okay to put my opinion in the story along with the facts, I took off with it, and I had fun writing it. It's uh, honest, entertaining, and humorous, and I've had several agents tell me that it was riveting. But nobody seemed to take hold and want to take it about themselves to publish it. No, they haven't. I've For the past two to three years, I've queried a lot of literary agents and publishers, and they've all read my work, and they really enjoyed it. But because I did not at the time have an author platform built up, they refused to sign me. So I decided once I started building my own audience that I would self-publish it on my own and leave them out of it. Well, that's their loss. (laughs) That's true. I think so. And I've been fortunate to have the context and we were able to get you in touch with another self-published author for him to give you tips on how to go about that process. Yes. In fact, when you put me in touch with him, he was the one that after speaking with him, convinced me that me self-publishing, it was the best, it's the best option for me. That's the best route to go. So thank you for putting me in contact with him. Of course. And that dude's such an awesome guy, and I can't wait to have him back on our show. Shout out to you, Vic, Mr. Vic Ferrari. Go check his books out on Amazon. Just type his name in, Vic Ferrari. He's a very funny guy. (laughs) So tell us what your book is called. The title of it is called The Notorious Texas Swindler. It's the mastermind behind the Grayson County Five. And, of course, it's about my cousin, Bob. He's the cattle wrestler. He got mixed up with all the criminals who the individuals that he got tied up with did and do today continue to get away with those crimes. And the thing is, he got in over his head. My story covers his life from beginning to present day, and it reveals everything that I found. So how long has it taken you to write this book? It's taken me 12 years to write the book. That's a long time. That is a very long time to be committed to something. It is. I've researched it, and I've had to write it over three or four different times because my work has been deleted by the individuals that I'm exposing. Wow. Um, my computer's been hacked into, and my my email, and yeah. So I, I've had to rewrite it by memory several times. My work has been lost, but somehow I just keep coming back to it. Here I am. Now it's completed and it's ready to get out there. That's amazing. That is amazing. And that is dedication right there. What is one of the most memorable times while working on this? 
One of the most memorable moments I had while working on this was an interview that I did. I've become fairly close to some of the victims. I don't really call them victims. I call them survivors and they're amazing people. But in the story, Bob was involved in a shootout. He held a married couple hostage in their home for nine hours. And he and another individual who broke out of the Grayson County Jail in Sherman, Texas. Anyhow, I I interviewed the couple and I became very close to them and their family. And one of the times that I went to visit Vincent, he was the husband. Um, Irma had passed away several years ago, but Vincent and I would talk on the phone and so he would he would ask me when I was going to see him. And sometimes it was just visits just to see how he and the rest of their family were doing. It wasn't always about an interview because I already had the story at that point. But one of the most memorable moments was when I was on the telephone with him and we were planning on me going to see him. And I said, Vincent, I'm going to bring my ice cream maker and we're going to make homemade ice cream. And he said, let's do it. So I took my homemade ice cream maker and we made we made homemade ice cream. And one of his sons, when he got off work, it was about three or three thirty. He drove up, and uh, he was look. They, he was looking forward to me coming to visit him. And I asked Vincent. I said, "I had an old churn style ice cream maker." And I asked Vincent. I said, "Did you tell him that he's going to have to be the one to turn the churn for the ice cream?" He said, "No, we'll wait till he gets here and let him do it." So once once he got there, we let him do all the hard work. And Vincent and I sat back, and once it was done, we ate homemade ice cream. <laughs> and to funny. me, and to, and to me, that's something you do with family. It may not necessarily be something you do when you're um, doing some of people you don't know, but that's how close I became with these individuals. They are considered a second family to me. That's what I was going to say. It's pretty amazing the bond that has this book has brought you. So some things you'll just keep forever, right? That's true. Yeah. And I still, like I said, I still keep in touch with them. Like I said, their family, I I love them just like I do my own family. And I guess that has to do with my style of writing. Um, When I'm writing a book, I want, I want the facts. I want the story and I want everybody's version. So when I'm putting it, it doesn't sound so... My, my true crime is a little different from everyone else's because it, it's a little more on a personal level. And I think that is what makes my, my writing different because I want everyone's perspective. Right. It's not just one-sided. Exactly. exactly. So what are the things that have kept you motivated to keep at it and make sure you've seen this through? My loved ones, my friends and family, they've encouraged me along the way. And even random strangers, sometimes if I'm in a store or something and I'm talking to someone, they might overhear what I'm working on. And they've told me, you know, this is your story. You need to own it. And that's what I've done. It's mine. And I need to tell it because it's based on a family member. And to me, it's important to get out there and tell what happened. I think that and then the times that I've gone to see Bob at visits, you know, we have a great visit and then all of a sudden it'll get quiet. And then he tells me, you know, I'm not the only one who should be sitting in here. There should be other people behind bars. Absolutely. And it's the reality of it. Right. It's just not fair. Exactly. So I think that along with all the people encouraging me and standing behind me, that's what's kept this book going. So you've had, you say you've had people hack into your computer and erase the whole book and all your stuff. What other things have they done to try to stop you from doing the research that you're doing to bring this um, bring this book to cri- life? Well, bring this crime ring to life and be able to uh, put the evidence out there on everything that you are researching. Well, I've had several of my family members and mine and and mine as well. Uh, the lug nuts on our cars have been loosened. I've had family members driving down the road and all of a sudden the tire will start to come off 
the vehicle. And that's not something that happens. Lug nuts are difficult to loosen. I mean, that's not something someone is gonna, is going to do unless they have a purpose. Well, yeah, an alternative um, motive. Mm-hmm. That's insane. so. A con- you know, between that, I've had people who've tried to steal the story from me. They have tried to write it as a fiction version. All types of things have happened. Uh, no, fortunately, no one in my family or myself has been hurt but we're always on alert absolutely you 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 have to be yeah especially putting the stuff out that you have shared to me that you have put out there in your book and kind of the name dropping that you have been doing it's you know these are big names that we are talking about and we will get into them on the podcast in later episodes but you know this is just getting to know you and what you're doing and making sure that people are looking out for your book. Yeah. So they can hear you up. out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think something that's important that people need to keep in mind is I'm not, I'm not just telling the story. Like I said, it's, I am a family member and I'm not citing with anyone. I'm simply putting the facts out there, but that's what I'm going to be doing is putting what I've uncovered and it will prove what I'm saying. And I want everyone to see that. So they'll see what really happened. I want them to know the real story. Absolutely. And I think once they see that, they'll, they'll believe what happened and they'll know it's, it's all facts. And it's, the thing is, it's public information, but somehow I'm the only one that found it or maybe the only one was interested enough to put it out there right or the only one brave enough to put it out there because you I mean like you said you're dealing with some scary stuff so I mean you you can't trust anybody at that point so you're just being brave and you're trying to get a story out thank you I think it has a lot to do with its family if it wasn't family if it wasn't about a family member then I don't know if I would have stuck with it as long as I had. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you're saying, you're not saying that he wasn't wrong in what he's doing, but you're saying that everybody else that was involved also needs the same punishment. Exactly. And so when do you plan on taking the next step and putting it out into readers' hands? I'm planning on releasing it sometime this summer. Since I decided to self-publish, things will be moving a little quicker for me. I'm currently working on building my fan base. And I'm also trying to get the artwork for my book together. I have found someone who eventually I do want to narrate the book so that it it can be on Audible. But I'm hoping that everything will be released sometime over the summer. Oh, that's awesome. And how does it feel after 12 long years to finally be at this point to say, yeah, I'm ready to put this out. I'm ready to publish. I'm ready to do this thing. You know, it feels really good. I didn't realize that I had all the support that I did. I I mean, I had family and close friends, but the more that I reach out to other individuals and explain what I'm doing, they are completely behind me. And it feels good. It's been 12 long years. It's been really rough. It's been difficult on myself and my family, but it's time. It's time for it to come out. And it feels good. Absolutely. It's probably like a weight being lifted in a sense. It is. Because 12 years, girl, that's that's dedication. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) This past 12 years, what have been the biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome to write your message in this book and get the correct um, evidence and the correct storyline? Well, I think the biggest obstacles, like I said, were going against the people who've tried to stand in the way of it, constantly watching to make sure my family is safe. I would go out of town. I would take trips the courthouses. I would drive hours away from home to get this information because 
the research I did was done old style. You couldn't find a lot of this information online. So I had to go to the courthouses. I had to dig through all the paperwork myself. I interviewed individuals who were not willing to speak to anyone else, but they felt comfortable enough talking to me. So the obstacles that I overcame, they were, there were a lot of them, but once I dug into it and I, I started it, it seemed like things would flow, you know, they flowed pretty quickly for me. So what has been the most enlightening moment that you've had during this process? <laughs> oh, wow. I haven't shared this with anyone else except for close friends and family. But about two years ago, I had had enough. I had to rewrite it again. As I said, for the third or fourth time, I can't remember. <clears throat> but I had a part-time job. I was working in a hospital gift shop. And right before I had to be at work, I took my laptop and I said, that's it. I'm done. I had a little conversation with God and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm finished. This has been deleted. I'm having to restart and I'm not going to do it again. So I took my laptop and I slammed it shut. I set it on the ottoman. I drove to work. I went in and 20 minutes after I was there, a lady came into the gift shop and she told me she didn't know why she was there, but she felt like she was there to pray for somebody. She said that her daughter, the woman was in town. She lived out of state and she was she was here to visit her daughter who was in another hospital on another side of town. And she had to go get a prescription. And somehow she ended up at the hospital where I was at. And she said she had this craving for a soda. And so she she came in. Instead of going to the cafeteria, she came into the gift shop. When she got into the gift shop, she had this urge to pray for someone. She came over to me and I told her what had happened to me 20, 30 minutes prior to her coming in. And she said, I'm supposed to pray for you. So she took my hand and we prayed. So she left. Probably about 15 minutes after that woman left, a nurse that was on the fourth floor in ICU got on the elevator and came down to the first floor. And instead of turning right to go to the cafeteria, she turned left and walked into the gift shop. She said, I do not know why I am in here. But I have the strong feeling I'm supposed to pray for somebody. I have stopped drinking sodas. She wanted a Coke. And she said, but I have a strong urge to get a Coke. And I feel like I'm supposed to pray for somebody. And I said, yeah, you're here for me. And I told her the story. So she took my hand and she prayed. Then she, she wanted me to keep her informed of what was going on. So she left. About 25 minutes later, another person walked in. It was a man and he came in and he said, I'm just thirsty. I want something to drink. I want a soda. And he was walking around the gift shop and he looked at me and he checked out and he said, before he left, he said, uh, God bless you. And he looked at me and he winked and he walked off. And to me, <laughs> those three individuals were a sign from God that I was supposed to take this story and I was supposed to put it out there. That is the most enlightening moment I've had working on this story is a sign from God, which is what I had. Oh, absolutely. It sounds like he was yelling at you. He wasn't even <laughs> trying to talk to you. He was telling you, girl, do not give up yet. So that's amazing. So when I when I got home, I picked up my laptop and I looked at what I was working on before and I closed it. And then the next day I got back on it. And that was the last and final time I had to write that story because now it's complete. See, so that was his way of saying only one more time. Only one more yeah, time. And you're the and I, I feel like he was telling me I'm the one that's supposed to do it because 
information that I've gotten in the past, like records and things, a lot of those records are not available today. That's amazing. What I've uncovered, some yeah. of those individuals have gone back to the courthouses and gotten the paperwork I have, and it's not there. I have copies of all that information, and it's been, it's, it's, court documented it's it's stamped by the state of texas so if ever it's needed again which it will be i have i have copies of it you have it see you're prepared and you do plan on writing more books than just this one don't you i do there is another one i'm interested in working on it's a cold case it happened here in central texas but i have not reached out to the family members or anyone who is currently investigating it, but it's something I'd like to dig into. But nothing's been finalized yet. So what's the one thing that you found to make this process of writing and trying to self-publish worth your time and effort? I think the fact that I've uncovered all this information and I feel confident with what I have and doing it while trying to go around all these people who are trying to stop me. I think that has a lot to do with what has made it worthwhile to me trying to expose these individuals. And I have information that they don't even know that I have. And to me that that makes it worthwhile knowing that I can stop individuals from all the criminal activity and trying to keep from hurting other people. That's what has made it worthwhile to me and getting it out there into people's hands. That's amazing. And what's one of the most scariest things that you faced while doing your investigating? Well, one of the most eye-opening experiences I faced during the process of writing the book was, was when we noticed that the lug nuts on our vehicles were loosened. Yeah, to the point be. that the tires, yeah, I mean, that that was enough to shake me. And I would have stopped. I would have stopped. But my family said, you know, they said, no, you keep going. We didn't, you didn't start this to stop. And that's the, that's the thing. Other people have tried to write this story. And I don't know what happened. But somewhere along the way, other individuals have tried to write it. And there have been a lot of. And and I will show this proof as we get further into the book. But there have been a lot of accusations of things that I'm actually proving to be true. And for some reason, the accusations just stop. And the people who have come out with some information have been quiet. And they don't continue. They're, they've They've been shut down. So... I didn't want to be another person that was shut down and was was stopped. So that's why I kept going. Somebody has to tell what's going on. Right. Um, and if they're coming for you and like loosening your wheels on your car, you obviously have something that they're scared of. You obviously and, have some truth behind what you're doing or they wouldn't be attacking you and deleting your stuff. So you're scaring them. I think it's also a proof of guilt. What they're doing proves their guilt. Absolutely. Well. That's what I'm saying. You they you have so much on them that you have scared them to the point that they would do anything. That's yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I've gotten the opportunity to read your book. And I'm only halfway through, but it's it's very it's a very interesting book in the way that you're writing and the backstory of just Bob that it the people around him is the people that you really need to be paying attention to. It's not just Bob. It's the people that he's dealing with. That's true. It's it's kind of funny because there's some things that I've uncovered in the beginning of the story. The first, I think it's probably a third or fourth chapter. I uncovered some some deceit, and Bob wasn't even aware of what was going on around him. He was young. He got caught up in a lot of stuff that he didn't know. I, he was 
19, 20 years old. He was young. So I've even uncovered some things that he wasn't even aware of. And you would think for a crook, they would know everything going on around him. But it goes to show that everybody was being played in the story. At the very end, Bob escaped from jail twice. And the second time he escaped, there were things that happened he wasn't even aware of then either. You know, I think I think he got in so much over his head and and by no means he's not innocent. He's not. He's just as guilty as everyone else. But it's important to know that these other individuals who walked away with their crimes, they're still committing them today. Only today they're more heinous. They really are. They're on a level where they're hurting other people. But they've gotten so sloppy with it that there are paper trails out there, which I've been fortunate enough to find and show what they're doing. I think these individuals have gotten so comfortable with what they're doing that they do anything and they won't stop. Somebody has to stop them. They do say like when you get too confident in something, you get sloppy at it. That's true. So they're yeah. just getting sloppy. You can't be too into what you're doing. That's true. That's true. That's what that is what I've learned through this whole ordeal. I always thought if somebody did something they they covered it up if they were able to get away with the crime, they must have been able to really cover that stuff up, but after a while they get so sloppy with it and comfortable that they just they do anything. So it obviously it shows proof. We all know that money, it takes a lot of money to keep from, I guess, ending up in the big house, which is where these people need to be. So well, it has to be that. It also I mean, has a lot to do with how big the crime ring is. And so how much money they're bringing in, how many people they have working for them. It's the people under them that are really getting sloppy because they're handing out these small jobs to these sloppy guys. And on turn, they're getting backtracked to these bigger individuals. Yeah, but they say money talks. That's true. It can talk you out of anything if you have enough. That's true. That's why so many famous people are, you know, not accountable for their actions. Yep, that so is true. So you have the money to get them out of it. Well, it, it, that and also their popularity. If they're well-liked and they have enough people behind them, then it's a combination of the money. The money is first, but their popularity. If there's someone that is so well-known that people are going to say, no, that doesn't make sense. I don't believe that this individual did this or was tied in with it. Then they're able to do things under the carpet and they don't think anyone's going to pull that, rip that carpet up and look underneath. Absolutely. And, you know, they get their characters, like you can make yourself be whoever you want to be in a public eye, but be somebody else behind a mask. So... They make these people believe that they're good people and that they would never do anything like that. But those, but they're always the ones that are the ones behind it. (laughs) And it's always a surprising moment when that comes out because they're always like, "Oh my God, I can't believe that this person would do that." They would never do that. What would make them do that? No, you know the people that would believe it are the ones who are open to the proof and the people that are closest to them that know them well enough. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yes. Like <laughs> the people that have been around those individuals that are not afraid to talk, they, they've commented, I'm not surprised. But then you have the other people that are that admire them from afar, but they don't know the full details. So you, you'd be surprised, you know, at the people who are willing to talk and those that are willing to talk are actually the ones that are closest to those individuals. And they know because they see it. Right. Yeah. I can yep. see that. Definitely. Yep. Cause you're, you're not going to know somebody unless you're close to them. In mm-hmm. a sense, like you can, have a best friend that you know nothing about, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not until you, like, know them and, like, be them 
that you'll know anything about them. People lead secret lives all the time. That's what I'm saying. You hear about these husbands killing their wives and all of that. Like, no woman in their right mind thinks that their husband's going to wake up one day and kill them. Like, right. But it happens. All the time. And it happens vice versa. With yeah, I was about to say. Going well, after men. Women do the same thing. I'm just saying, you don't, you don't, you never really know somebody. Well, I mean, it could even be as That's far true. as the school teacher, you know, that has all these academic awards and is very well known. He could be secretly being a pedophile mm -hmm. to these young children that he's teaching. Yeah. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's just a crazy world that we live in and how it gets publicized nowadays. Absolutely. You just never and know. And you're going to have the people that admire that teacher believing that, oh, no, that's not true until the evidence comes out. And then they're, the people are just stunned and shocked. And then you you're have right. the people that maybe know that person of course you would think if someone is a pedophile that someone close to them if they knew that they would come out and surely they would you would you would hope that you would hope but you, you know, people yeah. are just sketchy these days <laughs> right secrets right. The reality are secrets. Of it is, and a lot of people yeah. are scared to come out with things they're just too scared to say the truth yeah, and it's kind of like in your case because people are after them and people are telling them that if you say something, you're going to get hurt or I'm going to do this to you or, you know, I'm going to make sure you're canceled. That's the kind of thing that makes us scared of coming out and talking about the abusers that we have and the people that are after us in that, kind of, in that sort of sense. Absolutely. Well, you know what has really push me to keep other than like I said people supporting me my friends and family but that day at the hospital when that happened I thought I could do anything and I'm being protected I mean I could I'll go full force with this and I'm being protected the story is supposed to get out there yeah you know sometimes you know you're supposed to do something and this this story is mine. This is what I was born to do, was tell this. Right. And sometimes you just know. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. You just know. Well, you have the full support over here at the BCE show. And we're rooting for you. And we're definitely uh, going to stay behind the scenes during this whole process with you. And we're so grateful that you've let us do it. Yeah, and I can't wait for some of them bombshells you got coming. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'm excited to come back on the show and expose a lot more to you guys. And I definitely appreciate your support. I really do. Yeah, we can't wait for the next recording because we know that there's going to be more interesting stuff that you're coming out with. And it's crazy that you that the more you dig that the different things that you're digging up uh, uh, along with it. And so it's actually kind of helping you just this story to be able to write different stories, right? It is. In fact, like I said, so the people that I'm uncovering are still committing crimes today. And I had to cut the book off. I had to stop because I could keep writing about this subject, but I had to stop. But the more that I'm digging, the more I'm finding out what is happening today. So there is a possibility there may be, uh, I don't know, maybe a sequel. I could possibly do a prequel. I mean, I could go in so many different directions with this book if I chose to. Just in when the last was, couple of weeks that we've been talking, you keep telling me that, hey, I got some more stuff for you. And I'm I'm getting pages upon pages of material from you. And it's been amazing to be able to be in this process of how a writer goes about to find their inspiration and their their motivation on top of what they want to write about. It's just awesome. Well, thank you. And I've enjoyed sharing it with, with you. Who would have thought true crime? I mean, I, I guess it makes sense. True crime is always ongoing. Even when you put them behind bars, they're still doing stuff. 
they don't have to be out in the real world. <laughs> no, because there's a lot of lot of uh, you know gang bosses and big guys still running their show from behind bars. Yeah, mm-hmm. from behind bars. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. You're absolutely right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. You can find us on Facebook, The Blue Collar Enlightenment Show, and on Twitter at The BCE Show. Remember to follow us and shoot us a message on what you think about the podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming on the show. 